Good morning, everyone. 13 Design and Leadership Beliefs to Practice. I like to say that I've worked professionally in the tech industry for just over 18 years now. And I definitely plan to create a video about my professional background as a product design lead and manager. But if you're interested, um, I'll leave my LinkedIn link down in the description below. Um, I woke up this morning originally writing a script for a video called Why Apps Are Failing You from a former product design lead manager. Uh, but before I released a video like that, I thought I'd share this list of design and leadership beliefs that I've created that I've carried with me for about six to seven years now. Um, I first came across this list listening to a podcast called The Crazy Ones by a creative director um, by the name of Stephen Gates, who I actually first came across during Adobe Max 2015. In all honesty, I can't recall what exactly he spoke about. It could have been. Um, I could be mixing up things here and there. He's kind of famous, or at least at the time, he was famous for two talks he used to give, one of them being how he considered designers to be the new age blue collar workers. Um, but it also could have been his, one of his other talks about how light bulbs are bullshit. Um, but I digress. Um, and side note, if you're a designer uh, listening to this, I'll be sure to leave his podcast link in the description below as well. Um, a lot of his stuff uh, and a lot of his episodes really resonated with me, and I'm sure I'll be referencing him um, here and there in future videos, because um, even uh, in my professional environment um, and running workshops, I tend to reference him a lot. And I'll definitely probably share some insights behind my own personal professional design experience, but this one in particular I wanted to share first because I wanted to share some background to my own personal philosophy, and I truly believe that this will resonate with not just designers, but anyone looking to improve their own leadership skills. So let's dive right in, in new, no particular order. Um, progressive optimism. I push myself and my teams to find new ideas and seek possibilities where others only see problems. In other words, identifying problems as opportunities. You hear this a lot, and you'll likely hear me say this in other videos as well, but I really believe it's way too easy to complain and way more difficult to problem solve in an effective manner. In fact, if you look at my uh, YouTube feed, um, uh, or not my YouTube feed, but I think a lot of people's YouTube feed, you'll find there's a lot of videos that go viral about people complaining about things. And I think that's one of the reasons why I also wanted to start off with this list to make sure kind of I set the ground or had some sort of content out to showcase what my philosophies are before I started just going off on rants and stuff. Um, and then ultimately, I also believe that's what design is supposed to do. It's meant to help solve problems by providing a variety of viable recommended solutions. That being said, let's move on to number two. Humanity matters. I create cultures where we value interpersonal skills and everyone supports each other to help bring out the best in each other. This second point is what really drew me into this list because this is something I'm truly passionate about. I know plenty of folks that don't know me personally, but as extroverted or social as I might seem, um, to be honest, I only seem like this to others because I've practiced positive social engagement throughout my life. Um, I'm sharing this because it's through this practice that I've been able to meet and become incredibly blessed to foster some amazing relationships with people. I turn 40 next month and I share this because it's really difficult these days to make genuine lasting friendships as you get older. And the ones that have stuck around like the ones I've shared in previous videos, I value because of their interpersonal skills and always supporting me to be the best version of myself, which is something that I always want to practice as well as share with others. Number three, continual resilience. Creativity is a messy process where things go wrong, but we understand that failing never makes you a failure unless we don't learn or improve from it. 
I think this is pretty straightforward, so nothing much to add here. I'm curious if you can see after only uh, three points in why this list uh, resonated with me so much. Um, let's move on to number four, which is a student and a teacher. I seek new ideas, viewpoints, and more, so I never stop learning and share what I've learned with my teams. If you ask anyone who's ever worked with me, if there's one thing that I've always enjoyed doing, it's sharing what I've learned with others. Um, I can empathize. In fact, that's probably the reason why I'm doing this YouTube thing, but uh, I can empathize and understand why there's also a large percentage of folks that prefer to keep things close to their chest. Um, but I personally found it more beneficial, at least from my personal experience across the board, that uh, when I share anything that I've learned, it's also a great way for me to reinforce what I've learned. Um, I also think it's a great way to practice self-awareness as well. I know I personally learn at a much higher rate when I'm engaged in a conversation or activity where we're sharing learned information. Um, it makes the experience a lot more memorable, which makes the learning more impactful. Um, so yeah, let's move on to number five. Never stop asking why. I ask why to understand the purpose, cause, and belief behind every decision. At this particular moment in time, I, I do have mixed feelings on this. Um, I think overall what many people in charge will publicly say um, that this is what they want, but depending on what type of environment or industry you're working in, this could end up harming you a lot more than benefiting you. Um, let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to share some of my own personal experiences, why I feel the way I do about this. But um, that being said, I do agree and believe overall that this is a positive trait to practice and have. Number six, be the user. I immerse myself in my user's world so I can create meaningful, human, and elegant experiences that solve unmet needs and real problems, not just depending on focus groups, but making a personal effort to speak to others no one else will speak to. There are three primary disciplines that are necessary in order to deliver uh, um, an app or a website or a product uh, within this tech field. Um, and you'll hear this quite often. The first discipline is the obvious one, the engineering team, the tech team. Um, these are your developers, the ones that actually create the product, um, that code the product. Then you have the product team, and these are your business reps, the ones that represent the stakeholders and make sure that the business needs are met. Um, and then there's finally my discipline, which is design. And based on my experience, this is the only discipline that really looks out for the end user, um, which, by the way, um, I don't just when I say end user, I don't just mean like the like maybe yourself using the apps and stuff like that. But I also mean anyone who is involved or hands on with the product, people behind the scenes as well, such as admins or moderators or internal users, etc. There's, if you watch the Nuyo video part one, um, there's a clip that I really wanted to include where Jive calls out a lot of the workers there behind the scenes that never get to get called out. I wanted to call this out because, um, in fact, one podcast that I listened to, and I think it was like MKBHD, if I remember correctly, he was talking about how he had spoken to YouTube engineers and how YouTube engineers were creating YouTube for uh, are making decisions on YouTube for 90% of the people that are just consumers, while the 10% of creators that 90% of the people consume um, are sort of left behind and their concerns on our needs are not really met. Um, I wanted to share this because that's a layer that's often forgotten and it is continued to be forgotten. It's one of the reasons why you hear so many problems happening um, just all over the world. I mean, you heard about it recently with the MGM hacks. You hear about it with banks. You hear about it with so many different places. And I would say a key reason why this is is because a lot of the workers are forgotten. So, you know, people talk about lack of communication. Um, you know, a lot of the time it's because no one's there to reinforce or guide or establish any sort of solution to handling communication. Um, and I'm sharing all of this because uh, with any product, 
you know, yes, you have the end user, but you also have the internal users or what I call the internal users, the ones behind the scenes that are moderating or the ones that are ad administrating, you know, any of the um, required actions or necessary tasks. So yeah, just wanted to share this because uh, the challenges I found that all companies deal with is really <laughs> finding the right balance to provide the best possible impact. So uh, hopefully this may kind of make sense. Um, but unfortunately, this is where most companies fail. And most of the time, honestly, from my perspective, it's because they're trying to save on cost of production. And even more unfortunately, the end user is often the one forgotten. Again, if you look at most recent trends with even movies and shows from Disney, um, what EA, uh, Electronic Arts, actually prioritizes in their FIFA games, um, even mobile apps that most users are expecting or should expect to just work um but i'll save that rant for another video let's move on to number seven um number seven ideas over execution i create authentic meaningful and strategic ideas that lead to innovative solutions never the other way around depending how you interpret this how you define authentic meaningful strategic or even how you define innovative, this belief can potentially drive you <laughs> mad in a lot of scenarios. Uh, there's a UX law called Occam's Razor, which many folks have defined and interpret as the simplest answer is usually the, the correct one. Um, but if you actually study and read into it, uh, what um, the William of Oakham really wanted to emphasize in that is that you shouldn't overcomplicate things. Um, and that's really it. And when you're looking at a variety of solutions, if you're looking at a variety of solutions, often the simplest theory is, you know, usually the correct one. So don't add layers to that, kind of stick with it and grow from there, foster that. Um, I'm sharing this because the reality is that many of these older, especially older corporate organizations that I've worked at is 80 to 90% of the time, an idea often comes to my desk, not as a problem to be solved, but a solution to design. Um, we want X in this way. When can you get it done? Um, one way I've attempted to address this issue in my career is taking on the task, but also expanding it and hypothesizing what problem the business thinks the solution is solving for. Um, because in all transparency, most of the time, the only rationale most of these companies have are just someone high enough saw something that they liked somewhere and decided it would be a good idea to include it in our offering. Um, and really, it sounds kind of simple, but that's genuinely kind of what it is. Um, and I have a bunch of examples as to which why I've told many designers that I've mentored that uh, especially in corporate environments um, to expect that 80 to 90% of your ideas and your work will never see the light of day. Um, so yeah. Uh, so I had a bit more to say about that than expected. Um, let's actually move on. Number eight, a cover band never changed the world. I build cultures that empower teams to create original ideas, not copying, but doing better than what others have done. Um, let me provide some additional context here. A company that I've admired and used as an example for a long time, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is Toyota. Toyota has a core principle that they follow called Kaizen, which essentially translates to continuous improvement. And I know in recent years, especially with the push for all electric, they haven't necessarily been in the forefront as innovators. But if you look at the data, you can't deny how impactful their products have been. They have have an incredible reputation for creating reliable, long-lasting, practical vehicles that also depreciate a lot less than a Ford or a BMW. Um, and if you've watched me speak in other my videos, you hear me say this often, but I genuinely don't believe there's necessarily a right or wrong way of doing things, just a better or worse. And whether you agree with me or this philosophy or not, um, I don't know, you can't really deny Toyota's mark on the automotive industry or deny a lot of the other examples out there. I think uh, just recently I heard a YouTube interview with Mr. Beast where he said, um, you know, you just got to put in the work, you know, once you hit 100 videos, then come talk to me. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, once I hit 100 videos, I'll be able to talk to him. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm sharing this insight because I also wanted to add that there's a clear distinction between 
copying and studying. Um, I think if you're copying to analyze, to replicate, to, and, and with the intent of studying and to learn, to figure out um, you know, what areas you can improve, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but when you're just copy pasting someone else's work um, and you're just changing a color, that's just lazy and you're not doing any good. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that uh, in the design industry. And, um, and even more unfortunately, there's a lot less people that can recognize when that's happening. One particular industry worth calling out is your cell phone industry. Um, it's almost a universal truth that no one really likes their cell phone carrier. Um, most probably don't have any particular feelings about it, except that their bill is too high. But I'd be curious if anyone out there, whether they're on AT&T, T-Mobile, or Verizon, has had a positive, seamless, intuitive experience when just trying to upgrade their phones um, through their website specifically. Um, I'm only calling this out because if you pay attention to the trends uh, with those big three, and in fact, any big three, um, you know, even ratings companies or banks and stuff, um, everybody's just copying each other um, from plan rates to promotions to their lack of useful customer support. Um, I have a feeling regardless what carrier someone might be on, they all have shared frustrating experiences. Um, and let's be honest with ourselves. Is there really anything in particular that these carriers are doing better than the other? You know, you could argue someone has a better network or whatnot, but how much, you know, does that matter to the majority of the audience? Um, anyways, moving on. I hope this isn't coming off like I'm just venting or complaining, but here it is. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to number nine. Creativity is an inclusive, inclusive pr uh, profession. Let's try this again. Creativity is an inclusive profession. Great ideas are a lot of hard work. Everyone creates those ideas differently. I build cultures that value and grow everyone's unique creative process. I'm not sure if it's because I'm a designer, but whenever I ask uh, other folks that are not in design if they consider themselves creative or not, I've also found them answering no. And mostly I think it's because a lot of them you know, might be thinking that when I'm asking them, I'm asking whether they paint or draw or play music or, you know, make videos, for instance. Um, but the fact is, just because you don't have an artistic skill set doesn't mean you're not creative. Um, say you have some guests arriving for dinner, but an hour before something happens and the dinner gets all messed up. Um, let's say the dog ate it or something like that. Um, what do you do? Do you panic? Do you cry? Or do you come up with some potential places to eat to go to? Or do you order takeout or Uber Eats? Or maybe you have a bunch of ingredients you left and you ask your friends to bring by some additional ingredients and you turn it into like a cooking party. Um, this may not seem like anything to you, but from my perspective, um, this can also be considered defined as being creative because you're coming up with creative solutions. Um, I wanted to share this because this has been especially difficult to maintain in an ideal fashion, especially in the tech industry and just my experience um, over the last few years during the pandemic, um, essentially because everybody works remote, which has made it really challenging to create and foster an inclusive working environment. Um, it doesn't mean it's not possible, but creating an inclusive environment also requires um, support and engagement from others, which is Never easy. Um, I'm sharing this because when I used to work in the office, I always kept my whiteboard sessions and workshops open to anyone who wanted to attend. In fact, I would encourage other disciplines um, that weren't designers, weren't engineers, that weren't product people um, to be involved with the brainstorming solutions. Um, and sometimes I've gotten some, let's call it restraint from others, but I found that the most viable product and solutions have often come from rooms that have the most diverse uh, representation. I can recall one workshop where we had not just product and dev representation, but we also had lawyers in the room, copywriters and analysts. Um, and the workshop was design led, but the solutions on the board came mostly from the lawyers and analysts. Um, engineers that were in the room mostly kept an eye on function and would chime in in terms of whenever they felt like there was a, a moment of obvious improvement from their end. Um, but overall, the better and final solutions the, that we came up with came from participants that don't work in tech, you know, um, which makes sense if you think about it, because at the time we were solving for a problem that they needed. Um, and this is where user research and things like that come in. But 
Uh, one other thing to note around that is that it's not like we all just agreed this was the best and moved on. You know, we made sure that every voice was heard, that we heard everybody talk about their concerns and we addressed them in the room. Um, and that, you know, we were able to hypothesize on any potential impacts to the solution we were coming up with. Um, it wasn't easy. It never is. But in the end, I can say with confidence that everyone across the org was engaged in a way that I had always envisioned it could. Um, and it actually set the tone and set the expectations correctly. So when we went into production mode, um, at the time, production felt really smooth. As chaotic as it felt, it still felt really smooth. Um, and I think, especially if you practice inclusivity in a, an honest way, um, you know, that's the result of that. So, yeah, wow, had a lot more to say about this one as well. Let's keep moving. Number 10, everything is our job. On my team, it's all your job and nothing is beneath anyone. We are all here to work together to create the future. I actually have a lot to say about this as well, which I'll do in another video. But to emphasize the previous point, practicing this mindset yourself is a great way to set an example and set this tone and you know set the stage. Um, I found that good people that have always been willing to do the same once they see me practicing it myself. Number 11, walk your talk. What we say and how we bring those words to life matters. So our actions always need to match our words. Um, again, not much to add here. I have actually said it uh, before. I brought um, before in one of the points, but let me add one thing that I will sort of typically ask myself. Um, one of the things I'll ask is, you know, have I followed through the promises and responsibilities that I've made? Um, am I setting the right example? Am I making any emotionally charged decisions right now? Um, just so we're clear, I'm also human. So the answer is not always yes or no. But um, in fact, like many designers, I know I'm overly critical about myself. So it's become a habit for me to rationalize both the yes and no. But either way, I think practicing this um, really is a good way to keep myself in check. Number 12, everyone creates our culture. Everyone is accountable for creating, growing, and owning the team's culture. I, I really believe this wholeheartedly. Um, you see example of this everywhere outside of just you know, working environments. You see this from the legendary 96 Bulls team to the legendary 09 Barcelona team. Um, I've studied other design organizations and sort of creative organizations before. And so, you know, if you know anything about Pixar, the early days during the Toy Story, early Toy Story uh, days, um, yeah, you hear about the, the camaraderie and how, you know, chaotic it was, but how they moved, you know, sort of in this, in this fashion um, to create such an incredible product. Um, all the poetry videos that I've been showcasing, showcasing the, you know, I've been wanting to showcase the communities and the, and sh possibly even showcasing other artistic communities here in New York City. Um, this is just an undeniable universal truth that I believe we all need to take more ownership of. So just something to, something to think about. Um, and last but not least, respectful and confident, but not delicate. Breakthroughs happens when team take risks Trust their instincts, speak their mind, not when they tiptoe around each other. Um, this is the one point that I saved for last because this is truly a double-edged sword. In fact, I'm still trying to figure out how best to share this without overexposing any unnecessary information and without sounding like a complaint or a rant. But I've had at least three instances where I've either left a job or got let go because of how I attempted to handle communicating with people in leadership roles above me that nearly 80% of the colleagues around me would, agree, would have agreed um, that their decision-making process was a key challenge to meeting or delivering on expectations. Um, through a combination of my experience and therefore my personality, I've developed a habit of wanting to address challenges, especially in situations when it's causing unnecessary tension for the majority of my environment. Um, I think that might be another reason why uh, I've been making these videos on YouTube so diligently because it, obviously I got a lot to say. Um, I'm essentially creating content I've been wanting to see and share with my friends and family that even with all of these challenges that are happening in my life at the moment, I've experienced and lived 
too much in my 40 years on this planet that motivate me to no longer come off just as a human being who regresses feeling sorry for themselves. Um, I'm not saying that I don't get those feelings anymore. I'm just sharing that this is one of the motivations I've come to, I think, just develop in life. Um, I know I stated this in an earlier video, but I mean it when I say I'm not one to just sit around if there's a problem or a challenge in front of me that I feel like I can do something about. And, um, you know, if I can't do something about something else, well, at least I can do this. Um, call it responsibility, call it duty, you could even call it ignorance. <laughs> but everything I've shared today are things that not only have resonated with me, but have helped me navigate through bad leadership. Um, I discovered actually Stephen Gates because he was saying things that I felt a good design lead would say. Um, that doesn't mean I agree with everything he said, uh, everything I've listened to, but looking at his accomplishments as well as the following he's created, I felt his insights carry a lot more weight and validity than many of the inexperienced leads that I've personally experienced myself. Um, yeah. And with that, wow. Let me try and wrap this up. Um, if you've made it this far into the video, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And please comment below. Let me know your thoughts on this. Um, I felt inspired to share this because this is actually something I've, I always share when I start a new job or formally introduce myself to a team. So if there's anybody that I've worked with out there, um, you've probably heard me say this before. Uh, I found it often helps set the tone because I'm sharing essentially what others can expect from me. And, um, hopefully it'll motivate others to, you know, hold themselves accountable as well. Um, but that being said, I've got another list of traits that I look for and benchmark for more specific to designers that I formerly managed in the past. Might have to share that next. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks again. If you enjoyed this video or other videos on my channel, um, please share, like, and subscribe. Uh, I'm David HGP, which by the way stands for Hong Guang Pyo, um, my Korean name. Um, and <laughs> until next time, peace, y'all. I come from earthquakes and oceans, from broken pavement to broken promises. I come from one end of the Pacific to the other end of the Atlantic, spent 10 years on an island studying the ocean in different strokes in order to sharpen my pen. I come from a father I no longer speak to, a mother whose language I find myself forgetting, and sisters I will never stop worrying about. I come from the subtlest of words can go a long, long way in every photo I've taken screens, thousands of them. I come from learning how to give a genuine smile, and I come from mastering how to mind my own business. I come from the color of my skin and all of its privileges, from Vincent Chin to the tears over Latasha Harlins and the trigger that was pulled when she turned her back. I come from backyard bullets and too many close calls. I come from being called white or black, as if I am a body of appropriation, mm. native to things that have never belonged to me. Come on. I come from a loneliness only cured by experience. Mm. I come from a generation still young at heart. I come from, I never thought I'd make it this far. Mm.